everybody. Just going to figure out how to use this one sec. All right, beautiful. Thank you so much for inviting me. So happy to be here. Love Montenegro and a great talk by biology as well. Um, so I'm going to shift gears a little bit and maybe expand the Overton window about when you think about network states. And I'm also going to talk a lot about this con concept of institutional alignment that um, I came up with and I wrote an article about um, back in December. And basically, I just to kind of briefly introduce this topic, it's um, I was having trouble making sense of a lot of like the political rearrangement that had been happening, not just in the United States, but broadly across the world, where people who are used to be on the left or the right um, are now kind of, they've, they've swapped in a lot of ways. And I was trying to make sense of this and um, came up with a, a new political compass and a way of thinking about it. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna introduce that concept and that compass. And uh, at the end, there's actually a, I, I made with JavaScript a quiz that you can take to map yourself on this political compass. And so I'll show you that QR code at the end. Um, and then, but also I'm going to relate this new way of thinking about alignment and in institutions with uh, the network state and different approaches that we can have to um, willing a network state into reality. So I'm super excited to get into this and um, I hope you enjoy it too. All right, I haven't spoken at an Ethereum conference before, and so I just briefly will introduce myself uh, a bit more. So I'm a surgeon in New York City. I do skin cancer surgery, but I also spend a lot of time thinking about big societal issues and geopolitics, and I write in my Substack, of course, so I'd love to have you there if, if you're interested. Um, I'm a longtime Bitcoiner as well. Um, more recently, I'm a, an Ethereum enjoyer too. Uh, and you know, even since I was a teenager, I was super interested in these different, you know, various self-sovereignty movements, whether it was the Free State Project, which I signed up for when I was like 16 years old, or, or Sealand. Maybe some of you know about Sealand, where uh, it was like a fortified military structure off the coast of England that a family took over and tried to declare as like a, as a, as a sovereign nation. Um, not sure the status of that currently, but I thought it was super cool at the time. And I, back when I was a teenager, I was in the Libertarian Party. So kind of I'm, I'm deeply steeped in all of these sovereignty movements, and I think they're very interesting. And I, now that we're so advanced digitally and with crypto, I, I think that the network state is, 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 the, next, is the next step in, in this movement. Um, and you can follow me on, on Twitter or um, reach out to me on social. All right, so this is the, the political compass that everyone's familiar with, where we have the economic left and the economic right versus the um, social scale between libertarian and authoritarian. And, uh, you know, back in 2010, 2012, this made a lot of sense. You know, life was simpler back then, and I kind of miss those days where um, people like on the economic left would argue with people on the economic right about things like, you know, whether we need to increase entitlements, whether the government is responsible for health care insurance, things like that. And people on the social libertarians would argue with like uh, social authoritarians on issues like uh, I don't know, cannabis legalization or gay marriage. Um, so back in the day, you know, back in 2010, 2012, this did a really good job of sorting people into their allies and sorting them away from their adversaries and explain politics in, in a way that uh, made a lot of sense. But it doesn't make sense anymore. Um, the reason why is because institutions I've had kind of like a crisis of confidence. Um, this has happened many different times in, in all over the world in many different countries. It happened with COVID initially in some of the poor responses that countries had to COVID. It happened with the lockdowns. It happened with denial of election results in, in the US and other countries. And so now, instead of like orienting politically ourselves by left and right, like the good old days, now it really is we're either for or we're, we're against these big institutions. And when I talk about big institutions, I'll get more into detail with, with this um, model that I came up with, but I'm talking about big things like the United Nations and NATO and the, even the New York Times and Harvard. Uh, are these, you know, net good for society? Are, are these detrimental to society? Is it a mixed bag? And these are the things that, that um, orient our politics now. And so it's a lot different than what it was 10, 10 20 years ago. Um, but before we dive into that model, I'm going to spend a lot of time describing it. Um, we should first ask this question, what is an institution anyway? 
And when I, when I made this model and wrote this article, I thought that we all just had a common understanding of what an institution is, but it ends up that's not the case, and institutions are actually quite complicated. And so subsequent to my essay, Vitalik wrote an essay as well um, entitled, What Even Is an Institution? He did a really good job um, diving deep into the different conceptualizations of institutions. He even did like some polls on his Mastodon and statistics on the polls to kind of drill down deeper and try to figure out what, what characteristics of uh, organization make it into an institution. Um, but I think that he'd agree that, you know, this is a very nebulous kind of question. It's just a very hard question to answer. But he did highlight this one quote by Robin Hansen, which really resonates with me. And that is that, you know, it's a general framework for what an institution is where masses recognize elites and those elites oversee experts. So if you think of like a democracy, um, the masses are like the voters and the elites that they recognize, I guess they vote for like politicians, senators, presidents, and then those elites, they appoint experts like, um, you know, justices of the court or maybe commissioners of the Food and Drug Administration. And so this general uh, framework for institutions works for many different things. Even if you think about the New York Times where the masses in that case are the readers of the New York Times, and they recognize the elites, which are maybe the owners or, or the New York Times company. And then the company appoints um, their investigative journalists or their subject matter experts, et cetera. So th I think this is a really good um, framework for what makes something an institution. Um, and then one more point I want to bring up before we dive into the model is this idea of institutional hegemons. So an institutional hegemon, hegemon is like a, the most dominant power. And so within institutions, all the different institutional sectors, there's one that's really predominant. And so for example, for criminal courts, like the International Criminal Court has the broadest jurisdiction. It's um, bigger than the European Court of Justice or the US Supreme Court has broader jurisdiction than like the district courts or local um, courts, of course. And, um, similarly, I think like the New York Times is maybe one of the foremost uh, printed news journalism, and so more so than the New York Post or Russia Today or Bitcoin Magazine. Um, I also took this from Vitalik's essay. And then the, similarly, the WHO, NATO, these are all like the big institutional hegemons that we currently have. And so I'll be asking later, like, are these valuable? Are they, this is like a mixed bag or are they totally corrupt and damaging to society? And that's, that's kind of uh, what a lot of this hinges on. So these are the three questions that I believe determines a lot of our alignment in politics today. So first, institutions in general, you know, not the ones that we have today, but just the whole concept of institutions. Do they serve society or not? Um, that's the first question. And then today's institutions, those hegemons I just went through, the New York Times, the WHO, uh, NATO, are, are these good for, success, for society currently? Are they valuable? And then what role does tech play in all of this? So looking back at um, this model that I came up with, uh, I guess we can start first on the y-axis, so this, this side here. So this is your support for institutions, the institutional hegemons that I laid out. So if you're very supportive of these, you're at the top. If you're you know, very against these, you're at the bottom. And the, the x-axis is whether you believe that institutions are good for society or, or whether they're, they're, they're more self-serving, whether they reinforce current elite power structures, for example. And then the, the z-axis is um, color, so it's the blue versus the red. And um, I skipped ahead a few here, sorry. So the, uh, the, the blue is more of uh, tech skeptics, traditionalists, and the red is people who are tech optimists, people who believe that Ethereum and Bitcoin and crypto and automation and AI are really important for society. Um, and so based on those three, ex, uh, those three axes, then you can arrive at like eight different archetypes. So there's, um, I guess, why don't we start at the top right, the institutionalist. So though, an institutionalist is someone who really believes in the importance of institutions as a concept, that they serve society, and really likes our current institutions like the United Nations and the CDC, whatnot, the WHO. And so those obviously are institutionalists, right? They're um, very supportive of current institutions. And um, the, the, those are, that's like the blue circle in the top right. And the red circle behind it is the same thing except for that it flips on the z-axis. So that's someone actually like myself who thinks that while institutions are valuable, we need to reform them with these 
new technologies, Bitcoin, crypto, automation, AI, things like that. So while I'm supportive of institutions, and in even our current institutions, um, reforming is, is important. And now if you um, look further down, like uh, in the contrarian and the sovereign individual quadrant, these are people who support the idea of institutions, but they think our current institutions are basically rotten. They're no good. And so for the tech naive, the, the ones that um, aren't super uh, optimistic about tech solutions, these are just kind of the traditional contrarians. So people who think that our current institutions are rotten and we just need to replace them with new institutions, with new people. And then the sovereign individual types, these are people who think maybe you know, our current institutions are terrible and we need to replace them instead with crypto or blockchain or um, tech like AI, et cetera. And so for, these people might argue, for example, that we need to replace the Fed and, and put Bitcoin in, in its place. And so th that's kind of like the sovereign individual archetype. And then there's also the, the people that score low on the X axis. So that's this side over here. And these are people who don't really believe that institutions serve society. Instead, they're more self-serving or serving of the elites. And for example, I'm sure there's no one in the room that kind of feels this way, or probably very few of you, hopefully, but these are like kleptocrats or dictators and people who feel that institutions are, are more for their self-preservation of power. Um, and those, are, those that are in power are at the top because they like those institutions, and those who are not in power are, are at the bottom here. And I think that, you know, that's all very complicated and it's easier just to think of actual people. So I made this little graphic that, that might be helpful. Um, I can go through some of these too. And if, if one of you are in the room and don't like where I put you on the graph, these are just guesses. I, I can move it if you want. But um, looking first at like the, the institutionalists, so on the top right you have people who used to be political adversaries, like uh, Joe Biden, a Democrat, and Liz Cheney, a Republican. In the old system, these people used to be adversaries, and they would argue about policy differences on, on gay marriage or economics or entitlements. But now they're basically the same. They're, they, all, they say the same thing. They're very supportive of, of institutions, basically, of NATO, of the Center for Disease Control, of the um, current power structures. And then I included like my CryptoPunk, my depiction of myself as like maybe a tech positive version of this. And uh, there's another writer I like, Noah Smith, who, who I also kind of think of in that way, where I like our institutions. I think I really like the New York Times. I think they do good journalism, but perhaps they could be better crypto reporters or then perhaps they could use time stamping or other um, te technological um, new technologies to, to better serve their mission. And same thing with NATO, et cetera. And then on the bottom right um, of the of the chart, you have the more of like the contrarian thinkers. And so the ones in the red are like the tech contrarians and the ones in the blue are, are, are more traditionalists. And this again includes people on the, on the right and the left. So on the right you have like Elon Musk and Peter Thiel and on the left you have um, Noam Chomsky and Robert F. Kennedy, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. But they're, they're united in their opposition to current institutional structures. They're you know, very skeptical of the Fed, of the United Nations, of NATO. Um, of these big institutional hegemons. And they want to the ones in the red, like the tech optimist versions, they want to replace these things with technology, with crypto, et cetera. Um, and then of course you have people that um, really think that institutions are more just to serve their own self-interest, right? They're not, they don't believe that institutions should serve society so much as just their own preservation of power. And so that's like Jair Bolsonaro or Donald Trump. And then the ones that um, are actually in power, like Putin and Xi Jinping, are a little bit higher up because um, the institutions, they support the institutions that are responsible for their power. Um, and then, of course, Xi Jinping is in red here because in, in um, China, of course, uses a, a lot of technology as part of like a digital panopticon to um, enforce stability and to retain power. Okay, so how does this all relate to the, the network state? Well, I think that those who are most interested in the network state are going to be people maybe in the reformer category or in the sovereign individual category. And um, so let's go through each of those. So network states for the reformer. So I kind of consider myself in this group. And um, the way that I see network states working for someone with a reform mindset is, and a lot of other people have described this too, but more of a piecemeal transition to a network state. So it could start with you know, the group of us in, at Zuzalu now, and uh, maybe a dinner club, or even 
like token gated messaging, like just kind of like a digital hangout. Um, people with aligned values. And then over time, perhaps we pool some funds together in a DAO or something and form a, a political action committee. And maybe we can use that political action committee to negotiate with governments for some, you know, things that we care about. And then over time, over the course of years, maybe we could see the, a special economic zone or an autonomous area within a country. And then many years down the road, if we've proven ourselves to be good citizens within a country, um, or just have you know, generated a lot of goodwill, maybe we can even move towards some kind of sovereignty in a limited way, for example. Um, so this is like how a reformer might approach the idea of network states while, pre while preserving what's good in institutions and, and promoting uh, new technologies to help them improve and reform. And there's many different ways that the, the anti-institutionalists, like the tech contrarians or the more traditional contrarians um, advocate for network states. And some of these, I think, are really benign, well-intended things. Other th others of them are less so. So I think that, like the most benign steel man version of, of this approach is um, people who think that they are just sounding the alarm on, on the inevitable demise of these institutions. So they think that institutions like, I don't know, the Fed or the United Nations or NATO, these are just doomed to fail no matter what. There is, there's no point trying to save these. And by advocating Bitcoin or moving to a crypto-friendly jurisdiction, et cetera. They're just trying to hand out like uh, a life raft on the Titanic. So I think that's like the most benign version of the tech contrarian approach to the network state. Um, there's some that are less benign. The, fir the first is like a beach exit, basically <laughs> exiting to the beach while the word world burns down. So, and that the world burning down could be a financial crisis or like a civil war or a kinetic war and, and just like preserving being selfish and preserving uh, what you have uh, while watching kind of society collapse. So that's uh, a bit less benign. <laughs> and then there's uh, accelerationism too, which for those of you who aren't familiar, accelerationists, they believe in like really leaning into the, the coming calamity. So if, if it's a civil war, they believe in, you know, instigating it, bringing it about sooner. That way that they can get through the calamity, push through the calamity and come out the other side and reach some kind of network spirituality or network state or nirvana that, that comes after this societal collapse. And I, I really am uncomfortable with this idea of pushing for societal collapse and so, you know, very much opposed to this, this way that some, some tech contrarians uh, feel that we should um, achieve network states. Anyway, I hope that this helped you think about these issues, helped you think about maybe where you lie um, in, in relation to institutions. Think about, you know, are institutions important like I think, or maybe you disagree, and that's fine that you, you feel that institutions should be replaced by something else. Um, in any case, you can take the quiz using this QR code. Um, I want to thank Vitalik, who helped me, who was a great sounding board when I was putting this together. And, um, Happy to talk more. This is my, my socials and my sub stack, and I'd love to hear your feedback. Thanks a lot.